It is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Martin McEwen is uh, a uh, really interesting, uh, dynamic speaker and as well uh, has a really interesting and dynamic background. Um, he is the director of the Movement Disorder Clinic at uh, UBC. At, uh, prior to um, getting his uh, MD degree, he uh, got a degree in engineering physics from McMaster University, and so that has given him a really different slant on the research projects that he does, and as well um, has advanced things like uh, mapping of the brain. He, um, after he did his MD degree, he specialized in neurology and then later did a fellowship in clinical electrophysiology, so quite a, a combination of uh, training and talents. He uh, is, besides being the director of the Movement Disorder Clinic, is also a professor of medicine and electrical engineering. And you may know, I hope you do, that the research center at UBC is internationally renowned. So please join me in welcoming Dr. McEwen. Thank you, Jean. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, actually, I have a bit of a confession uh, to make. Uh, I grew up in a small town, Ontario, a town of about 5,000 people called Deep River. And one day, my sister made these beautiful and wonderfully tasting bars called Nanaimo bars. And at that time, I thought, well, that's an interesting name. Maybe Mr. Nanaimo had invented these. And it was only later that I realized that Nanaimo was a beautiful city. So the other thing I noticed, we lived in the States for about eight years. And I found that two things could always be a clue if you knew someone was Canadian without them saying. Number one is if they knew what a Timbit was. And number two, if they knew what an Nanaimo bar is, because no one in the States knows what an Nanaimo bar is. So anyways, it's, it's great to be here. So this morning, I would like to talk um, basically about two things. Uh, one is just a, a general review about Parkinson's. Uh, I know many of you have family members uh, with Parkinson's. Some of you have Parkinson's. And I think it's good to just kind of outline so that we're all um, on the same page with regards to uh, this condition. And then later I'm gonna talk a little bit about what things are new. Um, I confess to being slightly biased and that I'll be tell you, telling you some about the research that we're doing at UBC, uh, but also touch on things that are uh, more generally, um, uh, you know, hot items in, in the Parkinson's field. So this is a, a little background about uh, Parkinson's. As uh, unsurprisingly, the reason why it's called Parkinson's disease is that it was originally described by Dr. Parkinson in 1817. And it really is a testimony to the skill of the early clinicians on how accurate his uh, description was. He discussed it as a shaking palsy. In other words, someone with tremor, and palsy means weakness. And uh, some of his descriptions, even now when you lay look back, for example, his description about constipation being an early uh, feature and so on, uh, it, it, it's, it's really quite remarkable how accurately he described uh, many of the symptoms. So how common is Parkinson's disease? Well, it's relatively common and it's probably going to become more common. Uh, so typically the onset is uh, between ages 40 and 70 with a peak uh, onset in the sixth decade. It affects greater than 100,000 Canadians, but I think that's probably a, a significant uh, under estimate. Uh, and as I said, th there is a suggestion that it is becoming more common. That may be due to a number of factors, uh, such as, for example, the population aging, um, but it also gets to the nature of the cause of the disease where, for example, exposures to toxins in the environment may be a contributing factor. And so, um, you know, some of these may result in an overall increase in the disease. Um, it is the second most common neurodegenerative uh, disorder after Alzheimer's and the most common uh, neurodegenerative movement disorder. Uh, so as I said, it is uh, common and it's going to become more common. One of the things that's a big challenge for people and also the people treating um, people with Parkinson's is how variable it is. So an obvious question when someone gets initial diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is, Doc, how, how, what am I going to be like in five years? And unfortunately, 
it's very difficult to answer that uh, because some people are doing very well decades after the initial diagnosis, other people not so well. And so one of the big mysteries of the disease of, is why it varies so much from person to person. It also means that speaking to your neighbor who is on a specific therapy is often not the best approach because what is optimum for your neighbor who has Parkinson's may not be best what's what's right for you. And so it's really important to have your therapy optimized by your physician so that it's tailored to you uh, because things tend to be so variable uh, across people. So what are some of the signs of symptoms? So if you look at this gentleman here, you'll notice he's not swinging this left arm and you can see there's tremor in both hands. So this is a gentleman with uh, mild early Parkinson's. Uh, so he's got tremor. If you were to try and move his wrist, you would notice that he would have some stiffness or resistance to movement. We call that rigidity in, in, uh, in uh, sort of medical parlance. Slow movement or bradykinesia is the technical term for that, where if people try and tap their fingers quickly, uh, they tend to move slowly. And maybe later there may be some issues with related to cognition. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but some of the cognitive problems can be quite subtle. So some people will say, you know, the first thing I notice is I have difficulty multitasking. So I'm at work and, you know, the phone rings and I'm trying to do that and this is on the computer and I can't seem to keep track of it all at once. So that is, you know, a common complaint is that there may be changes, for example, in multitasking and some other types, subtle types of cognition. So things that we often see, but are usually later on in the disease, are a loss of balance. And falling is usually a big source of what we call morbidity uh, in people with Parkinson's. So some of the medications that I'll describe work very well for the slowness of movement, but unfortunately, they do not work well for balance. And so balance is a big, big problem with people with Parkinson's disease. And it is often what gets people in trouble later on because they've got poor balance, they fall down and they unfortunately bang their head or break a hip, get into hospital, get sick. You know, these are the things that get people into trouble. So uh, balance, there's lots of research being done on balance because it is one of the symptoms that is not typically responsive to medication. Uh, another thing is, is when people uh, feel dizzy or lightheaded. This is a common complaint. Almost always this is due to the fact that your blood pressure actually is too low. So what can happen is when you stand up, all the blood normally rushes to your legs. Now there's supposed to be a reflex that squeezes the blood back up to the brain, but that reflex is impaired in Parkinson's and sometimes the medications can actually make that worse. So what happens is, you stand up, your blood pressure drops, and your brain complains saying, I'm not getting enough blood, and you feel dizzy. And sometimes it can be so bad that people pass out. So that's uh, another thing that we see. Changes in people's voice, or hypophonia is the name for that. Uh, that is, can be a problem. There are uh, types of speech-language pathology uh, interventions that could be done for that. And then later, uh, possibly changes in memory and or uh, personality. These are things that we, we may see. So one of the things is, a big question is, how do we know that someone actually has Parkinson's disease? And this is one of the huge challenges, because there's many things that look like Parkinson's, but are not Parkinson's. And this is the important thing to realize, is that there's no single test that your doctor can do that tells you whether or not you've got Parkinson's. If it was just a blood test or a brain scan we could do, it would be wonderful. But unfortunately, it's not. And sometimes people don't fit into nice, neat categories. There's some people who have classic presentations of Parkinson's, and some people have classic presentations of other things that may look like Parkinson's, and then there's people who are kind of a little bit in between. And this is part of the challenge of why you need to have things tailored for you as an individual because it can be uh, quite variable between subjects. Now, one thing that help us lean towards the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, if things start to uh, start on one side of the body, so if people get tremor in one hand only, that's more likely to be Parkinson's disease than other things that look like Parkinson's. Uh, as I said, tremor, you don't have to have tremor to have a diagnosis of Parkinson's, but it supports the diagnosis. 
And the other thing we like to see, which is probably the most important, is that when you're on a medication like levodopa, the trade name for that is Cinemet or Prolopa, that you would expect to see good response to that. And if someone doesn't have good response to levodopa, it always raises in the back of your mind that maybe we're not dealing with Parkinson's disease, but one of the other uh, Parkinson's mimics. Things that weigh against whether or not you may have Parkinson's disease, if it's symmetric, if, if you notice that you've got stiffness that's exactly equal on both sides of the body, uh, that means we may not be dealing with Parkinson's. If there's no tremor, if you don't respond to levodopa medication. If there's changes in your balance very early on, I did mention that you can have problems with your balance, but that's usually a much later manifestation of Parkinson's disease. If it comes on early, it may be a sign that, that we're dealing with something else uh, besides Parkinson's. Uh, early changes in, me in memory and cognition. Again, these tend to be much later changes that we see in the disease, and if they come on early, it's a bit of a red flag for us saying maybe we are not dealing with uh, Parkinson's disease, but one of the mimics. And then again, early changes in the dizziness that I mentioned when you stand up and you feel dizzy. If that's a prominent early manifestation, it's a bit of a red flag that we might be dealing with one of the Parkinson's disease uh, mimics. So these are the things that, that we test for when you come in to see the neurologist who tests you for Parkinson's. These are the things that are at least in the back of their mind. Now, what causes the symptoms of Parkinson's disease? So if we look at a brain scan here, this is an MRI scan, and we look at this area here, this is an area that's called the substantia nigra, which uh, nigra, as you know, is Latin for black. So these are melanin-containing brain cells that secrete a brain chemical called dopamine. And for unknown reason, these cells die off prematurely. And so most of the medications that are designed to treat Parkinson's are designed to replace this chemical that your brain is no longer making. Early on in the disease, the medicine is just doing a bit of a top-up. In other words, your brain almost makes enough, but not quite enough, so you just need a top-up. As the disease progresses, you need more and more to get back to the normal condition. And that's why often you'll hear this erroneous assumption that they'll say, oh, levodopa, I've heard, just works for the first little while. Well, that's not true. What it means is early on in the disease, your brain is almost making enough, so it just needs a little top up. But as the disease progresses, your brain's making less and less, so you need more of the medication. It's not that the medication is becoming less effective, it's just that your brain is making less, so you need more medicine to get back to the normal value. So as I said, these are these uh, cells, and one of the things that's extremely important is that by the time people have become symptomatic, in other words, by the time people have tremor and a lot of stiffness, a lot of these cells are already gone. And so this is why there's a lot of emphasis on not just in Parkinson's, but all neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, is whether or not we can pick things up very, very early. Uh, because if there are treatments that can kind of reverse the cell loss or prevent the cell loss, obviously the sooner that that can uh, get going, uh, the better. So there's a lot of interest now on trying to detect Parkinson's before you even notice it. So for example, one of the things that has been noticed is loss of smell. So some people will often say when they've had Parkinson's that they lost um, their sense of smell years before they develop symptoms. So that might be an early thing. There have been studies, for example, that have shown constipation uh, may come on years or even decades before you develop uh, Parkinson's, which has raised the possibility that the disease may actually start in the gut. The other thing is there are some sleep changes that can occur years or even decades before the ultimate development of Parkinson's symptoms. So the, there is a trend in the field to kind of use these early symptoms to try and make the diagnosis before it becomes clinically apparent and make interventions early. So what does dopamine do? Uh, so this is kind of a funny chemical. So this is a brain chemical that is what's called a neuromodulator, and it changes things, some of the interactions between part of the brain. Uh, one of the things is it's obviously important for movement. That's why when your brain doesn't make enough uh, dopamine, 
that your, uh, your movement becomes affected and you become slow and you become stiff. But the other thing that's a bit unusual is it's part of the reward chemical in the brain. And this is why may, many of you may have heard about some of the Parkinson's drugs may make people take up gambling, for example, or become more impulsive, or become compulsive shopping, or compulsive e eating. And you would say, well, that's strange. Why would that occur? Well, the answer is, is that if the medicine is being given to help the movement, it may, um, unfortunately, also disrupt the reward pathway in the brain. And so people go from being risk averse, in other words, these are not the bungee jumpers of the world or the skydivers of the world, and then if you take the medicine, you may swing them to the opposite extreme where people, instead of becoming risk avoiders, start to become risk takers. And that's because um, the dopamine molecule is involved in both reward and in movement. So, uh, obviously, if, if the problem is, is that these cells die prematurely, the big question is, well, why do these cells die? What is, why are these cells dying off prematurely? And like a lot of things in medicine, it's probably a complex combination of genetic predisposition and environmental causes. So this has uh, been borne out. So if we look um, at um, a microscopic view of a neuron in the substantia nigra, we notice that there are these what are called inclusion bodies of abnormal proteins that's called alpha-synucleins. So a lot of research now is looking at wh what this protein is supposed to be doing normally and why does it accumulate in the cell abnormally. So, as I mentioned, these cells probably die off because of some complex interaction between your genetic makeup that may predispose you and um, perhaps some environmental factors. Now, they've done some epidemiological studies. A lot of these were done in Canada, actually, by our colleagues in the prairies who found out, for example, that pesticides may be a risk factor because they looked at farmers in Saskatchewan and they noticed that they had a much higher incidence of Parkinson's. However, two things have come out to be uh, known to be negatively associated with Parkinson's. One is close to my heart and one isn't. So it turns out that smokers, for whatever reason, tend to have a lower incidence of Parkinson's. Now, we certainly don't go out and suggest people take up smoking. Uh, we don't know whether or not this is a causal relationship or merely a, a correlation, but it has come up over and over again that people who smoke tend to have a lower incidence of Parkinson's. Coffee also is negatively associated with Parkinson's. And so there was an interest actually in caffeine being a helpful treatment for Parkinson's. So uh, there was a, a group uh, in Montreal and in Toronto that were looking at coffee as being a treatment for a number of things, such as the low blood pressure when you stand up and sleepiness, which can be a common complaint in Parkinson's. And they found that um, much to their pleasant surprise, is not only did the coffee help with the sleepiness and with the blood pressure, it also improved some of the symptoms of Parkinson's. So this prompted a big caffeine trial that was done across Canada, and, and UBC was involved. But unfortunately, it was a negative trial. In other words, they didn't find enough benefit from it so that they had to stop the trial prematurely. But it is still kind of fascinating that, that coffee drinkers seem to uh, be less likely to develop Parkinson's. So, as I mentioned, if the main symptom of Parkinson's doesn't emerge until more than half of these cells are lost, what are some of the early warning signs that we can be looking at? Well, as I mentioned, loss of smell. Uh, now, the problem is, is that this is a sensitive but non-specific thing. And what I mean by that is if you have a stuff, stuffy nose, you won't be able to smell anything. Uh, so even though it is almost all people with Parkinson's will have impaired smell, not everyone with impaired smell has Parkinson's. So there have been some suggestions, for example, by our colleagues in Nova Scotia who suggested that maybe we should do this in a two-stage fashion. First, 
do screening of smell, and you can get these scratch and sniff uh, tests that you can, you know, that you have in women's magazines where you can scratch and, and smell the perfume and stuff. Well, they have these sticks uh, that are marketed from uh, Pencil the University of Pennsylvania, where you can actually formally test people's smell. And uh, what the, what they've suggested is maybe we could do a two pronged approach. First, mass screen many people for their sense of smell take that small subset of people who have impaired smell and then do the more expensive imaging to see which of those you know, people uh, who have poor smell also have some of the imaging changes compatible with uh, Parkinson's. So these types of combined approaches, I think, will be important in the future. Uh, and early, another thing that we often see is depression and anxiety. So. It was quite uncommon for someone who's never suffered from uh, depression and anxiety who all of a sudden, say, in their 50s and 60s, this starts to become prominent. And so there's a number of uh, situations where we see that, that that was when people look back after they've been diagnosed, they say, you know, the first thing I really noticed was my mood started to get low. So. Um, in addition to this being an early sign, it is a big problem in people with Parkinson's disease. It's probably under-recognized, and it has, can have a profound impact on people's quality of life. So typically, when we have people come to our clinic, we have them fill out a little questionnaire. It's called a, a Beck Depression Inventory, which is a, a questionnaire that you fill out. And although it's, it's a relatively crude screen, it is a quite a useful tool to pick up whether or not people's mood may be significantly impaired. So, but it can be an early manifestation. The other thing are sleep disturbances. Uh, so um, these were our dogs, actually. Poor George is no longer with us, but Allie is uh, still around. So uh, you know, if people start to have early changes in their sleep. So for example, I'm going to show you a YouTube clip of Biscuit the dog. So this dog is actually sleeping. Now normally when you dream, you're supposed to be paralyzed, but you can see that this dog is not paralyzed, and now he's awake. So unfortunately that can happen in people as well. So normally when people dream, you're supposed to be paralyzed so you don't act out your dream. But in a subset of the population, uh, there is this thing called RBD, or REM behavioral um, disturbance, and what that means is that uh, people act out their dreams. And as I said, this is one of the things that have been shown to come on years, even decades before uh, the ultimate development of Parkinson's. The other thing that can be seen is uh, uh, changes in fa people's facial expression. So people are, tend to have a mask-like face, so they don't have the same facial expression uh, that they used to have, and that can be an early sign. Uh, changes in handwriting. So the classic description is what's called micrographia, or uh, handwriting becomes smaller. So uh, sometimes what people would do is they would ask them to pull out their driver's license or their credit card that they signed two or three years ago and then have them sign their name again. And if it's shrunk down a little bit, then that's the, you know, could be suggestive of changes. The other things that we can sometimes see uh, are stiffness uh, and changes in the neck. I've lost count the number of people who initially presented to their doctor and were given a diagnosis of frozen shoulder. And the reason why their shoulder was frozen is because they had developed Parkinson's on that side and they weren't swinging their arm and so they got frozen shoulder. So we see this uh, not infrequently. So changes in stiffness, that's um, uh, quite frequent. As I mentioned before, uh, constipation. So one of, uh, one of the things at UBC that we've been doing a lot is uh, a lot more genetic screening. And, um, so, and we have discovered a couple of genes that are associated with um, Parkinson's. But one of the biggest surprises that came out of the genetic screening is that some of the genes that are, uh, uh, that are relatively rare but are associated with Parkinson's disease are also associated with gut disease. And this was kind of surprising. And so there's a lot of interest now on the role that the gut plays in Parkinson's. And there's some suggestion that maybe the disease starts in the gut. Are there toxins that originally start in the gut and then spread up to the rest of the brain? So the, these are the things that um, are currently being investigated. <coughs> Another early problem that we see is tremor. 
So this is what we call rest tremor. So it's, you know, if people, as soon as they start to move or, you know, um, write, write something, the tremor tends to go away. This, this is just when people are sitting there watching TV or actually walking. Often walking will bring out the tremor. Uh, this is a YouTube video of someone with tremor. You can see that when they're sitting there, they've, they've got tremor. But as soon as they're asked to move, you see that the tremor disappears. So there are other types of tremor with other diseases that are not Parkinson's where that's not the case. But you can see as soon as they move, the tremor disappears. So this is quite typical um, of the tremor that we see with, uh, with Parkinson's disease. And as I mentioned before, early decreased arm swing. Uh, you can see that this gentleman here is not moving his arm, and he's got uh, tremor when he walks. So that it can be a, a very early sign. So this raises the question of the idea of a biomarker. So what a biomarker is is something that we can measure and quantify that can we, we use as kind of a surrogate uh, for uh, overall disability. So for example, let's say we, we ha uh, had a medicine that we thought would improve uh, the lives of people with Parkinson's. Well, if we were to do a, a, a study, we may have to wait decades to see how well this medicine works. We, you know, we'd have to give a pill and have one group take the medicine and follow them for many, many years. Now that would mean that it would take a long, long time to develop new medications. So what is typically done is we find something called a biomarker that we can measure, which we think is gonna correlate very nicely with overall disability. And that way what we can do is we can see whether or not the drug improves the biomarker. So there's lots of interest on developing these biomarkers. So one of the big ones is related to the dopamine system, obviously. So this is a microscopic view in a cartoon of a synapse or a communication between one brain cell and another. So this is a communication between two neurons, and these are the dopamine molecules that are released into the synapse and, and then are um, received by this receiving neuron. So this is the way brain cells uh, communicate. So one of the things that you can do to assess this dopamine is something called a PET scan. So this is a quite an accurate um, biomarker, and in fact, UBC is one of the lead centers in the world uh, in doing this. Uh, but it's an expensive biomarker. It probably costs uh, over two and a half thousand dollars at least uh, to do a specific scan. So the way these scans work is they take a molecule that looks like dopamine and they glue to it something that's very, very mildly radioactive. And by mildly, I mean probably less radiation than if you went on a plane from here to Toronto. So it's a very small amount. But what they do is they glue the dopamine to this radioactive tracer, and then they inject the tracer into the person, and everywhere the dopamine goes, the radioactivity goes. So if you put someone in a camera that's sensitive to the radioactivity, you can see what part of the brain lights up. And so this is a useful biomarker, uh, but it's expensive. Uh, other biomarkers that have been investigated, uh, motor performance. So you may have heard actually that there is an app now from Apple where you can take your iPhone. Unfortunately, it's not available in Canada, but one of the things they have is they have you tap on your iPhone and this may sort of track you over time. I'll talk a little bit about more of that. Shape volume parts of the brain. So as we get older, our brains shrink. But it turns out the brains shrink in very specific ways. And so if we can examine parts of the brain by doing an MRI scan and looking at very specific parts of the brain and how they shrink, then that can be a useful biomarker how parts of the brain communicate with one another. So we know that one of the important features of the brain is that different parts of the brain have to talk to one another, and if that's impaired, that can be an early sign of changes in Parkinson's. Changes in the brain waves, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. The other interesting thing is that the brain actually innervates your heart. So, you know, sometimes if you get excited, your heart beats faster. Well, it's known that that communication between the heart and the brain is impaired in Parkinson's, and that might be an early thing. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the innervation of the gut. 
these are all things that have been suggested uh, as uh, ways to look at a biomarker. But I think ultimately the mistake has been is that it's, is we're all looking for that one magic bullet, which is that one test that we can do uh, on people and say, yes, you've got Parkinson's, no, you don't. And I would suggest that that's probably a naive hope that what's probably going to be more likely is we're going to have to judiciously combine these and say, okay, you scored high on this, low on this, high on this, and medium on this, okay, there's a good chance you've got Parkinson's. I think we're going to have to use these uh, combined biomarkers. So assuming that someone actually has Parkinson's disease, uh, what should be done? Well, we've always had this notion that you know, we have this brain that's being dragged downwards uh, by this kind of disease, but I think that that's probably uh, an incomplete picture. What I think is probably more likely is to think of it more like a tug of war. So there's the disease that's trying to drag down the brain, but the brain's doing its darndest to try and fight this. And so there are lots of uh, compensatory mechanisms that occur in the brain. And this might be an independent uh, way to target therapy. So not only should we be trying to reduce disease, but we should also be trying to augment some of the uh, compensatory mechanisms. And this may be some of the way, for example, how exercise may help. It may not reverse some of the cells, but it may empower the brain to kind of rewire uh, to deal with the disease. And I think this is one way we have to think about this. So uh, can we slow cell loss or promote um, compensatory mechanisms? Well, there is a medication. I have a question mark here. Uh, we actually use quite a bit of it. It's called Resagiline or Azelect. Um, the FDA did not agree that it slowed the progression of the disease, but there was some controversy. So what they did basically is they uh, took two groups of people with Parkinson's, and like all uh, trials, they gave half people placebo and then half the people this drug. But then what they did, which was clever, is six months later, they gave everyone the drug. And then they compared the people who started the Resagiline earlier versus the people who started it later. And the people who started it earlier always did better. So this was the basis for considering that Resagiline may actually slow the progression of the disease. However, as we're going to hear about later from Matt, uh, exercise is probably uh, the best evidence that this is uh, useful. Now, and that we have, all of us have had a number of people who are extremely physically active, who just managed to keep their Parkinson's at bay for a very long time. Now, I shouldn't really say this because it's a bit of speculation, but one of the things that we've noticed is there seems to be a subset of people on resagiline who are so-called super responders. And empirically, I've noticed those are the people who tend to exercise a lot. So. Uh, we have a suspicion, and I can't really claim this to be true, but I have a suspicion that p exercise plus resagiline is a particularly a potent combination. So what happens if uh, exercise is not enough? What do we do next? Well, here's a gentleman with a pretty severe Parkinson's. He's got the Parkinsonian walk. He's not moving his arms. He's turning with multiple so small steps. And this is him after taking some levodopa medication. It's pretty dramatic. So levodopa medication is the oldest. It is now up, this is now the 50 year anniversary of treating people with Parkinson's with levodopa, which is kind of amazing when you think of it. Uh, and that's because when it works, it can work spectacularly well. So, however, this is one of the things that I wish uh, physicians who treat people with Parkinson's would realize. I think this is the most important slide of the whole talk. And that is this idea of a therapeutic window. So imagine if you take a tablet and you plot the concentration of the medicine over time. So if you lick the tablet and don't take any, nothing happens. If you take bucket loads, eventually you're going to get some sort of toxic level where you get unacceptable side effects. Between having enough so that it works and not having too much so you don't get side effects is what's called the therapeutic window. All drugs have this. 
Unfortunately, with levodopa is as the disease progresses, this therapeutic window narrows. And so you get people who are in the difficult situation where they need more medicine to be on, but as soon as they get on, they rapidly overshoot and get these excessive movements that are called dyskinesias. And this is the big challenge in people, uh, dealing with people with advanced Parkinson's. And so this is why when people are, say, in a nursing home, and uh, most of the infrastructure of medicine, as you probably realize, are not geared towards giving medicine in a time-critical fashion. So, for example, it doesn't really matter a damn if you get your high blood pressure medicine an hour later, or your anti-cholesterol or lower uh, your uh, hypercholesterol medicine, you know, half an hour late. But it can make a profound difference to someone with advanced Parkinson's if they get their levodopa medication late. And uh, sometimes I don't think this message gets through to a lot of their caregivers. And um, I think this is a, a huge. Uh, a, a huge shame and a huge tragedy. So, one of the concerns that you will read on the internet is that levodopa, when levodopa first came out, there was this concern that it would kind of wear out the remaining neurons and that if you took levodopa, it would speed up the disease process. This has clearly been shown not to be the case, but there's a number of people that I will see who will come in, they're severely disabled, with uh, severe Parkinson's, and they refuse to go on levodopa because of what they've read on the internet. I would caution you against that uh, because there are problems to not being treated. Uh, you remember, there are the brain is trying to compensate for the disease, and so um, you know the the theory is probably we want to normalize, keep the brain as normal as possible for as long as possible. So that argues towards treating earlier rather than later. And as I mentioned, we're now at the 50-year anniversary of levodopa. Millions of people around the world have been on this medication. We know everything about this medication because it's been around for so long. So, as I said, if anyone ever tells you, because they read on the internet, that you shouldn't take levodopa because it'll speed up the disease, it's clearly not been shown to be the case, okay? Uh, so the other option is, is someone is, um, is surgery. So uh, let me see if I can get my, I don't know why this isn't playing. Let me. So this is a deep brain stimulation therapy. Uh, and you can see what they do is they have a battery uh, powered pacemaker. And this goes up a wire to an electrode that's inserted uh, deep inside the brain. When this works, it can work spectacularly well. However, there's a few caveats. Number one is that it's an expensive and a very difficult therapy to get. So there is only one surgeon who does this, Dr. Chris Honey at uh, Vancouver General, and who does it for the whole province. He has a three-year waiting list, which is unacceptably long, obviously. Uh, the other issue is that if this electrode moves so much as a couple of millimeters in the wrong direction, then you can get uh, unacceptable side effects. Uh, changes in personality, changes in profound depression, worsening in cognition, and so on. So as I said, when it works for the right people, it can work spectacularly well, uh, but it's not a panacea. And obviously, not everyone's healthy enough to undergo uh, a, you know, an intensive operation. So I think for some people, it's a good option, uh, but it's not for everyone. Another thing that's become uh, recently available in Canada, but has been around for a while in, um, in Europe, is uh, this, thing, this um, delivery system that's called Duodopa. And what this is, as I mentioned, the big problem with the levodopa medication is when this therapeutic window is very narrow, people can oscillate between having these excessive movements, the dyskinesias, and being wearing off, and they can just oscillate back and forth all day long. And so for those people, surgery is an option, but the other option who, for people who might not be surgical candidates is this duodopa preparation. So what this is, is this is essentially a gel of levodopa. And instead of taking the pills where there can be erratic absorption in the stomach, what is done is a small tube is inserted through the abdominal wall into the jejunum, which is where the, the levodopa medicine is normally absorbed. So instead of intermittently taking pills, what happens 
is that this levodopa preparation is continuously infused into where it gets absorbed. And for the right people, this can work uh, spectacularly well. Uh, there are a few downsides to this, obviously. One is, is you have to carry around this pouch. So what they do in Toronto, if someone they think might be a candidate for this, is they say, well, forget about inserting this tube. I want you to walk around with this pouch with this pump attached to you for two weeks. And if you come back and say, I can't live like this, then you're not a good candidate. But for certain people, it can be a, a, a very good therapy. Now, we have had a bit of challenge uh, here, as maybe Gene will be uh, alluding to later, that this is not currently covered in BC, even for select patients. And we've currently advocating strongly to the government, because I think in some select patients, this can be uh, groundbreaking, uh, and it can be an excellent therapy. Uh, it's covered in some places, like Ontario and um, Quebec and Alberta and I think Manitoba, uh, but not in BC. And so we have a number of people that we think, uh, at least in our clinic in Vancouver, who we think would be excellent candidate for this therapy, um, but um, it, it, it's not currently covered. The other thing that I would warn you about, and this is something, again, that was discovered uh, at our center, is this placebo effect. You've all heard of the placebo effect, you know, if someone gives you a sugar pill. But one of the things that is, you, is important to realize is that the placebo is especially important in Parkinson's disease. The reason being is it was recently discovered that the placebo effect is mediated through the brain chemical dopamine, which is again, which I mentioned was the reward signal. So it means that if you can convince someone with Parkinson's that you have a treatment and they have a placebo effect, their Parkinson's will get better because the placebo effect releases dopamine, which treats their Parkinson's. So if I have a, a therapy that says I'm going to, I don't know, hit you with a wet noodle and convince you by charging you lots of money that this will help your Parkinson's and you believe it, it will help your Parkinson's because the, dope, the placebo effect will re, um, release dopamine and treat your Parkinson's. So this means that people can be particularly vulnerable to therapies that only work through the placebo effect. And uh, unfortunately, we've seen a number of people who've faced uh, financial ruin by looking at therapies that are probably working uh, through the placebo effect. And as I said, they actually work. But of course, once the placebo effect wears off, after about three months. So, you know, there are a number of people who've gone to Mexico for their stem cell treatment, stem cell treatment. And they'll do great for a few months, but then they'll kind of regress back to where they were. And I would argue that that's almost certainly a placebo effect. And when the placebo effect uh, release dopamine, they did better, but it's going to wear off. So I think I would just caution you to, uh, to think about that. Um, one of the things that um, we have to be concerned about is um, some of the what are called non-motor features of people with Parkinson's. Fortunately, now that people are living longer with the disease and uh, living longer and better and more productive lives, some of the things that can occur later on uh, start to become more prominent. And so the so-called non-motor features of Parkinson's can affect a, a relatively high percentage of people. And these are things like depression, as I mentioned. Uh, it was probably under-recognized. Anxiety. Apathy. So the apathy is a problem. So apathy can be really frustrating, particularly for family members, because someone with Parkinson's just may not feel like doing anything. Now, often when you see apathy in people who don't have Parkinson's, it's usually in the setting of depression. But in Parkinson's, even if people are not depressed, they can also have apathy. And it's unclear how to treat this. Uh, changes uh, in their blood pressure, which is the dizziness standing up, changes in sexual function, bladder. So what happens is that your bladder can become irritable. So normally, uh, your bladder, if it's left to its own devices, as soon as it fills up, it will just contract, and unless it receives a message from the brain to say, you know, relax, relax, don't pee yet, don't pee yet. And unfortunately, that message from the brain uh, may not may not be as good anymore getting to the bladder. And so what people will find is that as soon as they get the urge to pee, if they don't run to the bathroom, they, they get an accident. And so that can be due to the Parkinson's. And sometimes a problem can be, in men especially, is that if you go to um, many clinicians, old man plus 
bladder problems equals prostate is, is usually what, you, and that would be a correct 99% of the time. All I'm saying is that if you have Parkinson's, you might be the 1% where that's not correct. And some of your bladder dysfunction may not be due to your prostate, but maybe due to the Parkinson's alone. Obviously, I can't comment on your prostate, but I can say that the Parkinson's itself can affect your bladder function, so it's useful to keep that in mind. Uh, sleep, fatigue, pain, psychosis, impulse control disorders, cognitive deficits. So these are all the things that we need to screen for uh, when you come into the clinic. Uh, now, I want to switch gears a little bit and say, that, you know, that was kind of an overview. Now I want to talk um, a bit more about some of the current research that's being done. And I think it's important, you know, everyone always wants to know, you know, is there a cure for Parkinson's? And I think it's important to work towards a cure that may be off in the distance. But I also think it's important to ease the burden of the disease. And if you look at the Parkinson's Society of Canada, that's actually their motto, you know, to find a cure and ease the burden. And I think research should be targeted towards both of these. It's fine to look for a cure, but what happens if a cure is way off? We need to be able to look at things that can help people now. And so I think we have to have a balance between a long-term strategy and a short-term strategy. So what are some of the things that I think are new that I'll talk about? Um, monitoring of Parkinson's disease, new imaging methods, new treatments, uh, sleep, and uh, PD and gut flora, and inflammation of PD. So I'll talk a little bit about these uh, one at a time. So um, this is a, a group, in, it's called Lilly, uh, which is uh, a university that's in, um, inside a university that's in Singapore, and it's uh, headed by uh, Dr. Miao. And what they are interested in is they're interested in looking at technologies to help older people stay independent for as long as possible. And the reason why I got involved is because I thought, well, that's exactly what we want to do with people with Parkinson's. So this is the type of things that they're involved in. So they, they you know, this is obviously a, a grandpa communicating with his grandchild via sort of telecommunication. So these are the types of things they're interested in. Uh, this is a virtual grocery store. So what can happen is you can kind of, um, you know, choose your loaf of bread in this virtual, uh, and then push a button, and then it charges it to your credit card, and they deliver the groceries to your home. You know, that type of thing. So uh, this is another thing where we've got involved in is whether or not we can have video games, and I put games in quotes, and even though it feels like you're playing a game, what it's actually doing is rehabilitating you and testing your Parkinson's. So these are the types of things that we uh, are interested in. So, and the other thing that, of course, is important to a place like Canada, where um, we have a, a relatively sparse population over distributed areas, this is exactly the type of thing that we could use for telemedicine. So, you know, the government, as you know, uh, spends millions of dollars to fly people down to specialist centers from remote communities. So, if a lot of this could be done remotely, uh, this would be very attractive. So here's a kind of an example of this. So here's a, a gentleman who's, uh, you know, playing basketball. And um, so, and this is the, the therapists who, who are trying to uh, come up with a customized uh, treatment for them based on their motion. And then what the game does is says, okay, these are the motions we want. We're going to have the game do these sort of things with the basketball. So, uh, and then this monitors their movements so that the therapist can, can look at this. So this is the type of thing. Uh, that, they're, they're, that they're dealing with. So it's all sort of um, modern sort of c computer technology. And so th this is the, the, I think, one thing that we're going to be seeing more and more. Uh, this is this idea of aging in place. Now, th you have to be careful, obviously. You don't want to have Big Brother staring at you all the time. But what they can do is, for example, is they can put sensors in the couch, sensors on... Uh, on the, the fridge door, for example. So they don't really have a picture of you, but they can kind of see. And you know what may happen is they may notice that you're pacing excessively. So you know, an automatic text message could go to your family member saying, listen, you know, your mother seems anxious. Maybe you should check in on them. So this type of thing uh, to try and balance the, um, the privacy of the individual with being able to sort of keep track of them so that it uh, uh, is, is done appropriately. 
And then the other thing is uh, this idea of, of personal big data. So, um, you know, many of you have heard about these Fitbit things that you can get, uh, that you can wear, that kind of measures your, uh, you know, we can monitor people's hearts and we can assess all of these things. So, um, we think if, if we're clever with computers and can kind of combine all of this, uh, it may be a good way to monitor people's Parkinson's. And so this is uh, one thing that we're looking at. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is uh, new imaging methods. So, you know, there's ways that we can kind of take an MRI scan and do three-dimensional reconstruction and look at some of these uh, brain regions, for example, to see whether or not they're shrinking. Uh, so this is a paper that uh, Dr. Cresswell and I uh, recently published in c conjunction with um, uh, collaborators at SFU where we basically took MRI scans and we used the computer to sort of isolate out these brain areas that are affected in Parkinson's and then we're able to um, you know predict how bad their Parkinson's was based on the shape of some of these brain regions so this gives you some idea so this is all from a standard MRI scan that you can get done locally so uh, this is all just kind of fancy analysis done on a standard structural MRI scan. So I think these, these types of things are gonna be useful. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, the white matter of the brain, which is kind of the wires that connect the brain cells together. This is uh, normally not thought to be affected in Parkinson's, but as we look more closely, we find it is. And so there are new methods, one of them that was developed at UBC actually for looking at this myelin and so, uh, I actually have a PhD student who's looking at that. The other thing that uh, my colleagues, uh, such as Dr. Stossel, are looking at um, is there is a um, protein that's called tau uh, that is normally associated with Alzheimer's, but it may be very important with um, uh, some of the people who have cognitive deficits in, in Parkinson's. So this is a PET scan that, that targets this molecule tau, and it may also be important actually for concussion. And so uh, the, uh, being able to target this may be uh, extremely useful. Uh, looking at novel treatments, so one of the things that we've started to look in is, is can we get some of the benefits of deep brain stimulation without having to do surgery? So one of the things we're looking at is whether or not we can stimulate uh, by just putting an electrode behind the ear, stimulate the vestibular system, which is the balance organ. And this may be a way to kind of activate uh, parts of the brain ver using various um, you know, specific stimuli. Now, the important thing to notice is that you don't feel the stimulus. But we've been able to show already that we can modulate the brain waves with the stimulus that you don't feel. And we've been able to show that it improves people's uh, motor performance in Parkinson's. So, uh, you know, this is all it is. It's just a wire behind here. But if we're clever about it, we, we, we're currently investigating, you know, how it modulates the brain waves, how it modulates connectivity in the brain, and how it improves motor performance. Uh, this, I won't spend too much time on this, but this is basically tracking error, and this is when the GVS was off, and this is when the GVS was on, and you can see that the tracking error all goes down, and pretty well everyone with Parkinson's once we turn this on. And then, as I said, the important thing is they don't feel this. So this is a non-invasive, non-medication way uh, to treat Parkinson's. Uh, the other thing we're looking at as well is um, whether or not we can measure the brain waves during sleep and actually stimulate during sleep. And this might be a way to augment people's uh, sleeping and possibly improve their sleeping. Uh, the other thing is, is there's been a huge, uh, let me just backtrack a bit, there's been huge uh, development in the field that's called BCI, or Brain Computer Interface. And let me just show you a little bit about this. So this is a video that was from, um, I think, the Wall Street Journal. And it's from the group of the University of Minnesota. And what they're doing is this gentleman here um, is, they're measuring his brain waves. So he's got a cap with all these electrodes. And what the brain wave, what he's doing is by only using his brain waves, he's steering this drone. So, for example, if he wants the drone to move left, he thinks of making a fist of his left hand. If he wants to make the drone move to the right, he thinks of making it. So just by thinking, he is controlling this. So look at this. So he's steering this solely by uh, using his brain waves, okay? So this is the camera on the front, you know, and he's kind of steering it through. 
And the reason why all of this has become developed is basically because computers are very fast and very powerful now. And so this isn't a way of just looking at the brain waves. You've got to do a number of uh, uh, number crunches. So this is Professor Hay from the University of Minnesota. And this is the way that they're, they're measuring his brain waves and then decoding based on what he's thinking, trying to steer it one way or the other. So he's saying, you know, if you make a fist, then you make it turn left or turn right or whatever. So the idea is, you know, once he thinks about something, it results in a specific type of brain wave that the computer then can kind of figure out. Now, how can we use this in Parkinson's? So this is uh, Su Jin Lee. She's a, a PhD student of mine. She used to work for Samsung in Korea. And so she's working on this where we're measuring the brain waves and seeing if we can come up with uh, an EEG signature of Parkinson's. In other words, can we measure your brain waves and estimate how, how severe your Parkinson's is? And uh, we've done that fairly well. So what we can do is this is basically what your Parkinson's is if we spend 20 minutes measuring your, how, ri how rigid you are and how fast you tap. And then this is if we judiciously combine these, um, you know, the connectivity in your brain waves, this is what is predicted. So you can see we get a very nice correlation, and these are the controls who have no Parkinson's, obviously. So we can very nicely predict how severe your Parkinson's is by measuring your brain waves. So what we want to do then is to feed back this signal as kind of a thermometer and have people say, think whatever you can to try and bring this thermometer down. Because what this thermometer is actually showing is an estimate based on your brain waves how severe your Parkinson's is. And this is one of the benefits actually of being a clinician scientist, is the reason why we got involved in this is there are a number of patients who have come to me and said, you know, when I do Qigong or Tai Chi or yoga or meditation, I feel great. My Parkinson's is really good. The problem is, is after about you know, 20 minutes or so, it, you know, all the symptoms come back. But the, the fact that so many people tell us this uh, makes us think that if, if we can use the brain waves and harness it in a significant way, that it can result in, in, a, in a therapy. And this is uh, one way to do that. So uh, we're currently investigating this. Uh, what's new? Uh, one of the things that is, is kind of hot now in neuroscience is what's called the microbiome. So believe it or not, we have more bacteria in our gut than we do have cells in our body. And so it's not quite you are what you eat, but almost. So we have uh, all sorts of bacteria in our gut. There have been a few studies now, like out of Finland, for example, that have shown that certain bacteria in the gut of people with Parkinson's are, are higher in Parkinson's than not, and vice versa. So this raises the intriguing possibility is, you know, could you take a probiotic or something that would then treat your Parkinson's? Uh, so this is one thing that's very uh, interesting. And so my colleague, Dr. Cresswell, is, uh, just, uh, just got approval actually two days ago uh, to look at a study where we're going to measure uh, the um, bacteria content in feces in people with Parkinson's and seeing whether or not there is any difference between people with Parkinson's and people who don't have Parkinson's and whether or not there's any changes in the brain that are associated with this. And this is interesting because it means is can we manipulate the gut flora to influence Parkinson's? So, you know, are there certain antibiotics we could give that would manipulate the gut flora? Are there probiotics that we can give? Uh, so this is kind of a, a hot area uh, that we don't really know where it's going to take us, but it's very new and I think potentially exciting. The other thing is that my colleagues, our pet colleagues are doing is uh, this idea of inflammation. So this was a story that's been bounced around for about 30 years as to whether or not one of the causes of Parkinson's may be inflammation. So one of the, th uh, the things that's a bit intriguing is they did find that if you took an anti-inflammatory, like ibuprofen, for example, that some people had um, a lower incidence of Parkinson's. Now, we don't recommend that because the anti-inflammatories have a lot of side effects. You can bleed into your gut and so on. But it is an interesting idea that maybe there is an important association between brain inflammation 
and Parkinson's. So one of the benefits of, of some of the newer PET imaging is whether or not we can target some of the inflammatory cells uh, using PET imaging. And so uh, currently uh, my colleagues are wondering whether or not uh, they can do PET imaging to look at inflammatory markers and see whether or not that's associated with changes in sleep in Parkinson's or whether or not it's uh, affected with depression in Parkinson's because this might be an independent way because we do have a lot of things up our sleeve to target inflammation. A lot of other diseases are, information, are associated with inflammation in the brain, for example, MS. So it may mean that some of the uh, anti-inflammatory uh, therapies that are already designed for treating inflammation in the brain may be appropriate for some of the features of Parkinson's. So that's basically all I had. I think my time is up. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, our uh, people who support our research. And uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And we, Gene and I, will be going around the room with microphones. So um, we do see hands, and then uh, we, will, we will get to you. So at this point, we only have one microphone. Uh, so Caroline, you, you, there's lots of hands up already, so pick one and, and get started, and I'll try and point to where the, the hands are. I just have a quick question about whether or not you have found Parkinson's in particular populations, like um, are there more in North America, more in a European background community, more uh, with First Nations, that kind of thing? Uh, that's a very good question. So um, I guess there's two ways you could answer that. So I guess it gets back to the whether or not there could be genetic differences or whether or not there could be environmental differences. Part of the problems with some of the genetic studies is that in places where there's huge population like China, for example, like we actually collaborate with a group in China, is it's very hard to get, uh, even though we can look at the incidence of the, of the genes, it's very hard to get a clinical diagnosis because they don't have the same um, uh, infrastructure as being able to diagnose Parkinson's accurately. Um, now, whether about the environment, well, there have been lots of studies, uh, including some done by my uh, colleague, Dr. Choi, about whether or not certain professions may put you at risk. So, for example, uh, one of the things that puts you at higher risk is being a teacher. And so the thought was if you're, you know, in school and kids are coughing on you all day, you know, you're going to be exposed to a lot of things. Unfortunately, being a healthcare worker puts you at higher risk. But being a construction worker where you're outside all day, put you at lower risk. And so, you know, and as I mentioned, uh, farmers and so on seem to be at higher risk. The thought was exposure to pesticides and so on. So I think right now uh, we can't say, uh, you know, it is true that some of the genes, rare genes that are associated with Parkinson's are higher. Like, for example, there's the African Berber population that have very high incidence of one of these genetic markers. But I would say it seems to cut across all races uh, relatively equally as far as we know. And as I said, there might be some environmental causes, but um, you know, as I said, it, it, it's still unclear. Thank you, Dr. McEwen. This is really fascinating, and I hope I can articulate my question. Um, you talked towards the end of the presentation about inflammation and about gut bacteria and stuff like that. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, the issue of cause and effect comes to mind. The, there, is there an assumption that the gut bacteria and the inflammation causes Parkinson's or is an effect of Parkinson's? And how does that impact your research? Uh, that's an excellent question. So this is a, you know, kind of a generic scientific question is, you know, if you have th something that is correlated, how do you know that one causes the other? And, um, you know, this is a sort of thing where there's no single test you can do. It has to be an accumulation of body of evidence. So, for example, to give you an idea about the gut thing, um, there was an association found by Professor Finley at UBC between certain antibiotics and subsequently developing asthma. So you would say, okay, well, that was a correlation. How do we know it's causation? So well, they were able to generate an animal model where they got rats and they, you know, they had their gut flora. They were able to see their gut flora. They gave antibiotics to these rats, and only the rats that got the antibiotics developed 
uh, you know, this, this asthma. So, you know, there are way, other ways that you can kind of manipulate things, but it is, it is challenging. And we don't know what is uh, chicken and the egg. But, for example, if um, one was, let's say one did find that there was a certain bacterium that was higher in people with Parkinson's, if you then treated that with an antibiotic and they got better, uh, you know, then there might be some causal relationship. But you're true that just because there's an association doesn't mean that something, and that's particularly true, for example, with the smoking and the coffee. You know, we're not saying that smoking protects you. Um, it's just that smokers tend to have a lower incidence of Parkinson's. That's why we don't suggest everyone pick up smoking, <laughs> right? So, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, good morning. Uh, could you comment upon the nature of the Lewy bodies associated with Parkinson's and the Lewy bodies associated with Lewy body dementia? Uh, okay, so this is this uh, idea of Lewy body dementia. So this is actually a bit of a controversy as to what Lewy body dementia is sometimes described as is, is a combination of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Uh, some people believe that um, Lewy body disease and Parkinson's disease with dementia are the same disease except on opposite ends of the spectrum. So in Lewy body dementia, the cognitive problems come on early and the Parkinson's comes on late, while in Parkinson's disease with dementia, the Parkinson's comes on first and the dementia comes on late. So um, I don't think it's, it's, it's still an open question. Yeah, still an open question. So Caroline, we have a question here first. Can you tell me how, to, how we can get involved in some of the studies? Um, yes, so the best thing is if you um, look at our website, uh, parkinsons.ubc.ca, uh, there are a number of clinical coordinators that have contact information that you can contact, and we would uh, be delighted if you uh, wanted to participate. So part of the problems that with the you should realize that that if we do any study, obviously it has to go um, uh, under very uh, rigorous um, ethics board review, and part of the ethics board review is not only to make sure that the you know that the research is appropriate and safe and so on, but they also have uh, how how we are allowed to contact potential participants. And so that's why I can't just flash up a sign, you know, please contact this, uh, because they, they're a bit picky about how we, because they don't want it uh, to appear that we coerce people into performing research. So when people see us in our clinic, we often ask them if we have permission to contact them, and if they say yes, all that does is, is we put a check mark beside their name, and that gives someone permission to call them. So someone can't just cold call you and say, do you want to participate in research? You have to give permission, actually, for someone to call you, so. Uh, Matt's, oh, and, Matt's and Matt is just showing out he's got um, some pamphlets with us. Do you wanna tell us about, about that? Yeah, I just have a couple research brochures, so I don't have enough for everyone because we're actually running out in the clinic, but I will have all of our contact information at the end of my presentation with emails and phone numbers that you can take down as well. What signifies mild cognitive impairment and does everybody with Parkinson's you know, I have to look forward to that. Um, okay, so I, I think maybe I, I, I think maybe one thing I said may have induced some confusion. So, there is a term called MCI or mild cognitive impairment, uh, which is usually used in the Alzheimer's field, and that is a, got a fairly strict criteria, which says you don't have full-blown Alzheimer's, but you have some early changes uh, in your memory that may or may not evolve into full-blown Alzheimer's. So if you Google, you know, mild cognitive impairment, that's what they were referring to. What I was alluding to is cognition is complicated. It's not just memory, but it's, you know, can you sequence things? Can you um, adjust things in space? Uh, you know, can you, do you have uh, appropriate language? And so what I was alluding to with Parkinson's is that sometimes just one small aspect of that, for example, multitasking, that can be affected you would not be classified as having mild, you know, the, the, the definition of mild cognitive impairment, even though if you had problems with multitasking, um, that is an impairment in your cognition. So it's a bit of semantics. Um, so 
one of the screens that we do is something called the MOCA, or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. It's actually available online, mochatest.org. Um, I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> suggest you go down to But it is a test that we, we routinely do, and that tests many aspects of cognition. It, it checks your visual spatial ability, and it checks your rec recall, um, you know, it checks your language um, fluency and so on. And so we do a screen for that, and if you, you know, have some mild impairment based on that total score, then we call it mild cognitive impairment. Yeah, thank you, Dr. McHugh. And I have two questions. Um, have you heard of uh, your hearing being affected by Parkinson's? Of what, sorry? Your hearing? Oh, hearing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was by design, yeah, yeah. Uh, affect a Parkinson's person? Uh, not that I'm aware of, not typically. Uh, there are conditions uh, that are that are very rare called mitochondrial conditions that are associated with hearing loss and they can be associated with Parkinsonism but in general I'm not aware of anyone who's made that uh, particular association doesn't mean it, it can happen but um, I'm not aware of it okay um, my hearing I believe has definitely gone down like for every reason who knows but I wasn't exactly clear on what you meant by um, a stimulus behind the ears to help Oh, Parkinson? I see. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Should okay. I hold off on getting new hearing aids? No, no, no. Is no, that no. close? No, no. Or is that no, 10 no. Years so, away? so it turns out that the inner ear, which is your balance organ, you've heard of your inner ear where that makes people dizzy. It's just because the nerve that provides balance is right next door to the nerve that provides hearing. So if we want to stimulate the balance organ, we have to stim put the electrode behind the ear. But that's to stimulate their inner ear, not the hearing part. So, the question, the question I have, sorry, the question I have is the actual on the sentiment when you're taking the actual medication, is the actual percentage that actually gets across the blood-brain brain barrier, and I hear it's really really low, like 10 percent of it gets across. Is that true? Uh, I don't have that exact number off the top of my head, but I uh, w wouldn't be surprised if it's a relatively low amount. So one of the things that's particularly pertinent is if you are on the CR prepar preparation, it's got a coating over it. And the coating is to prevent the medicine from being absorbed too quickly, but sometimes the coating works too well, and it means that you, get, you may not be absorbing the medication. And so part of that also could be associated with your gut flora, for example. So people have bacterial overgrowth, can get erratic absorption of the medicine. So it wouldn't surprise me if you, know, if you take 100 milligram by mouth that only 10 milligrams gets across into your brain. But what I'm not clear about is um, what the fraction is that gets, once it gets into your bloodstream, I would think most of it in your bloodstream gets into your, across the blood-brain barrier. But how much from your gut gets into your bloodstream, I think that's where the biggest loss would be. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So my question has two parts. Um, if you have, if, when you're talking about the duodopa pump, does the cinemet still have to cross the blood-brain barrier? Yes. So really all this is doing is bypassing your, your throat and your stomach. It's okay. the same as the taking Cinemet, but it's just continuously infused into the part of the gut where Cinemet normally gets absorbed. Okay. Um, but relating to the last question, if it's um, introduced at a later date, sort of, so to speak, would that mean that there would be less lost, um, so there would m be more getting through the blood-brain barrier? Sorry, I don't understand. At a later date, what do you what okay. do you mean? Okay, so because it's introduced, um, it's introduced further through the digestive system. Oh, I see. Rather than taking it by mouth. No, well, I, yeah, I think that the the main issue is 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 not so much the total amount. It's it's really how consistent it is. See, okay. when you take a pill. You know, it's, it goes through the stomach, there may be food there, and, it, and um, there may be erratic absorption depending on how well your, your contractions of your esophagus and your, muscle, uh, and your stomach are propelling the food along, and all of that causes erratic absorption. So I think it's less the total amount that's getting into your brain, it's more 
how erratic it is. And the thing, the big benefit of the Duodopa pump is that once they titrate the level that's specific for you, and of course, that specific level may be influenced by several factors, such as, as you mentioned, you know, the, as the gut flora or how much gets into the blood-brain barrier and so on. But the key point is, is it's steady. And that's more kind of the, the natural state of the dopamine. It tends to be relatively steady. And so very often, we do know, just to kind of go off as an aside, uh, we do know that it's better or more physiologic to take smaller doses of levodopa more frequently than big doses far apart. Now, obviously, that's less convenient. You don't want to have to take pills every half hour, but that is more physiologic. So uh, one of the things that we typically see if we've seen people who've been seen by other centers is we often don't change the total daily dose, but we break up the doses into smaller doses more frequently um, because the, you know, the, the ultimate of that, of course, is duodopa where it's the same dose all, all the time. Um, I recently read something about them now having an injectable form of L-DOPA. And in that case, why can't, because it's critical that they take their medication on time, and an apathetic, sleepy person doesn't do that without a lot of pressure, why wouldn't the next step be a pump? Like a diabetic has an insulin pump, why couldn't we have a dopamine pump? Uh, well, um, I guess the question is, is whether or not we can give something uh, subcutaneously. So there is apomorphine that, that is injectable. Uh, it's not available in Canada. It is available in the U.S. Um, and as I said, yeah, I, the, the pump is, um, that's basically what duodopa is, right? It, it's injectable, but it's not in, in, into the skin or into the muscle. It's right into the gut. And, and that's uh, exactly what, what you would like. Wouldn't it be better just to go directly into the bloodstream and then you don't have to worry about the gut bacteria? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. But I think there's, there's some issues if you do that. So, for example, like postural hypotension and so on. But that, that's a good point is why can't you just uh, go right into the bloodstream? And um, there must be something to do with the pharmacokinetics of that that make it um, unwise. I have one more question. Do you have any opinion on CP, uh, CBD? on cannabis, on Parkinson's disease. On cannabis? Uh, I think it's a, in particular. What's that? The cannabinoid, not the THC. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's, it's um, not clear yet, actually, on um, some of the cannabinoids and, and, and medical marijuana on Parkinson's. I think the best benefit appears to be associated with uh, dyskinesias. Uh, so I think that may have play a role. Um, the big concern I would have about it is um, whether or not apathy may get worse, because uh, that's, you know, that's already a big problem. And, um, you know, there's some suggestion that psychosis and cognition may be negatively impacted. So I think the, the jury's out yet, but um, there are, I have a number of people who um, uh, seem to think it's um, helpful. Although it's interestingly, one of uh, my neurology colleagues in Victoria and he sees people with Parkinson's and a different condition, MS. And he says the MS people love the, the cannabinoids and, and the marijuana, but not the people with Parkinson's. And I think it's because the people with the MS, they tend to have more spasticity and they get these painful spasms. And the marijuana seems to be particularly useful for that. So uh, I think it's um, the jury's still out on, on what role it plays and how we would fit it in. But yes. Uh, thank you for a really interesting talk. Uh, my question is, uh, with a newly diagnosed person, you emphasize the importance of starting levodopa or other treatment early. Uh, would you recommend that even in a person who's not bothered by their symptoms yet? And is that because it has, you believe, some neuroprotective effect? Uh, yeah, so that, again, it's the sort of thing that I, I, I would discuss with your doctor. So I think if someone's not bothered by their symptoms, if we saw somebody was not bothered by their symptoms, and again, I can't give, I can maybe talk to you later, but in general, if I have someone who's got very mild things that I'm not bothered, the only thing I would suggest to them is they exercise and possibly start resagiline. Uh, that would be the only thing. Uh, but if they don't have, if they're not bothered by the symptoms, what I'm talking about is people 
there are some people who discount their symptoms. For example, they say, oh yeah, I'm fine, and yet we can see that they're not swinging their arm, and I know that if they don't get some medication in, they're gonna end up with a frozen shoulder. Or, you know, the, part of the argument as well to start levodopa early is it'll keep them mobile, which will enable them to exercise, which has shown to be neuroprotective. So, but if people can exercise well, uh, without any medicine, then I wouldn't do anything except consider possibly resagiline. Hi. Right there. Okay, I don't really need it. Actually, I was um, interested in what you were saying about the galvanic vestibular stimulation, and I was expecting you to say that it improved your balance, but mm -hmm. you said it, it increased the, um, the motor skills. Mm -hmm. And so then I was just thinking about the... Um, the correlation between the balance and the motor symptoms, and if you worked on balance without this um, system in place, would that also improve the, the motor symptoms, or, or how do the two relate with respect to that? Uh, well, that's a very good question. So, um, so uh, even though I mentioned the, mo the motor system, we are actually looking at the role of uh, GVS in, in balance, the galvanic vestibular stimulation. We're also looking at it uh, in the role in apathy as, as well. Um, but to get back to your question is, would this, you know, what are the um, overall benef potential beneficial effects of stimulating the vestibular system? Well, I've had, again, this is the benefit of being a clinician scientist and seeing many patients, and some people will tell me, that if they're, uh, they said there was uh, someone who told me that they were on a, a train and the, the train was kind of vibrating as it was going along the tracks. And they said, my Parkinson's just magically got better when I was, and so again, and then there was other people who told me that, uh, you know, you can get these things to vibrate that are uh, treatments that maybe our physiotherapist can tell us about where they, you know, you hold onto these platforms that vibrate. And I think the goal of that is to kind of um, activate your core muscles as kind of a, a way to exercise, but there are some people who think that helps their Parkinson's. So, and there's been some treatment uh, in rats, at least, in Parkinson's where they've stimulated the spinal cord, and that has resulted in improvements in their Parkinson's. So I agree that there, this whole idea of, of kind of vibration and balance, uh, how that positively um, benefits the people with Parkinson's, it's unclear. One of the things we do know is that people with Parkinson's do have these abnormal brain waves, and it may be that stimulating the vestibular system or the balance system may correct some of these brain waves. So that's one thing that we're looking at. Hi, I've heard different, uh, had different advice from different doctors on when I could eat and when I could take L-DOPA, mm -hmm. the timing. Yeah, that's a very good question because it's a common cause of misconception. So. Um, one of the, or when people first start on the levodopa medication, one of the side effects is uh, nausea. So it turns out that your gut has its own little brain, and if you give dopamine, it can actually induce nausea. And in fact, just as an aside, uh, sometimes um, one of the potent anti-nausea drugs that are given in hospital is very bad for people with Parkinson's. It's called Maxoran or metoclopramide, so make sure no one ever gives you that. Um, and that's because it actually blocks dopamine and it's used for nausea. So as I said, because one of the early side effects of levodopa when people first start on the medicine is nausea, they often say take it with food. And early on in the disease, uh, when you just need a top-up of your dopamine levels, taking it with the food is probably a good idea. However, as the disease gets more advanced, what happens is the medicine has to go from your gut into the bloodstream, and then from the bloodstream cross the blood-brain barrier into the brain. And it turns out that when, it, when it's crossing from the blood into the brain, it competes with protein. And so if you have a high protein meal, at the same time you take the levodopa, you may notice that the medicine doesn't work as well. And that's because both the protein and the medicine are fighting to get into the brain. So that's when they say take the medicine outside of meals. So I think the, the bottom line is early on in the disease, if you're just starting out, take it with meals. If you've had it for a while, try to take it about an hour plus or minus your meal times. And 
Our nurse often likes to say that you probably want to take it with a very light snack, like a cracker or a cookie, because you don't want it just sitting in your stomach. It actually gets absorbed past the stomach. So you need a, a little bit of food just to get it past that, but you don't want to make a high protein meal. We did have one gentleman who was doing fine, and all of a sudden he called up and said, you know, there's something going on in my Parkinson's, everything's out of whack, and we couldn't figure out what it was. To make a long story short, what it was is he was taking his pills with tablespoons of peanut butter. And what happened is that the protein in the peanut butter was just kind of negating the, the, the levodopa, and that's, that's what the cause was. So I, I hope that clears that up. We have one more question over here, and then we'll take a quick break. Hi, I'm just wondering about um, any tips on how people with Parkinson's can get a better sleep. Do they take their meds at a certain time, or sometimes they get up in the middle of the night? Uh, that's, a, that's actually a very complicated question uh, because, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately the answer is it depends. So um, there are some people who seem to be able to recharge themselves during sleep, the lucky people. So I'll ask people, you know, when's the best time of the day? And they'll say, you know, when I wake up, I just feel great. And then within a few minutes, then, you know, things kick in, I slow down. And then there's other people who say, well, my worst time of the day is I wake up because I'm stiff, I'm sore, I haven't taken any medicine from the night before. So some people manage to kind of recharge during sleep and other people don't. So it depends. If, if people um, are not sleeping because the medicine's wearing off, then it makes sense to take a medicine before you go to bed. One of the clues, which I think is under-recognized, is there is a symptom that's called akasisia. And what that means is an inner restlessness that's associated with low dopamine. So there are a lot of people who say, you know, at the middle of the night, I'll, I'll get up, I'll feel restless, I need to get up and pace around, and, and that's usually a sign that their medicine is worn off. So that may be helpful. But on the other hand, maybe the reason why people aren't sleeping is because they have to get up five times a night to pee because of bladder instability, so the treatment of that would be different. The other thing is, is this REM behavior of sleep disorder where people act out their dreams that often responds to uh, you know, over-the-counter medications like melatonin, and there's, there's ways it's treated differently. So as I said, it, it really is kind of complicated. It depends what's causing the problems with sleep, and it has to be targeted accordingly. So, so thank you, uh, Dr. McEwen. Uh, an incredible wealth of knowledge, as you can, can hear, and just some really fascinating information around some of the research projects that are happening. Please join with me in thanking Dr. McEwen.